what's up everybody, Chad Kalick here, and welcome back to the In a Crowded Room podcast, where on this episode, we are going to talk about the bizarre events surrounding Mr. Ashton Kutcher, who I just recorded a podcast in which I discussed that Ashton and Mel Gibson announced that they were going to bond together and make a film that was going to expose the wrongdoings of Hollywood. Since I made that podcast, a shitstorm has been swirling around Ashton, which we're going to talk about in just a second. But before we do, I just wanted to take a second here to tell all of you how much it meant to read your comments after uh, the posting of the last In a Crowded Room podcast episode where I discussed what I had uh, gone through over the last 10 months. And, uh, you know, I know it all begs questions as to how did this all happen. Um, and again, that will be in Harbingers, which I'm right now, I'm actually uh, clearing up some music for uh, this extended trailer that I'm going to be releasing. And they have a shoot this Saturday that I need to film a few things. Uh, but it is being polished right now, and I'm just about done with it. Uh, and, and again, things just, they just took a bit longer because I unexpectedly um, had a ton of physical therapy uh, come down, which is uh, actually a good thing. And uh, it just, it didn't leave much time in the day for me to do much more. Um, but everything continues to go incredible. So, um, thank you all so much for your comments. They really did mean a lot to me. And uh, look, man, you know, you guys were a big part of me, uh, you know, finding the drive to get better. Not only, you know, of course, did I uh, want to have more time here on planet Earth uh, with Laura and with my partners and best friends and and, uh, of course, this beautiful little puppy, Chapo, sitting here next to me. Um, but I, I truly love what I do. And um, I love sharing stories with you guys and sharing the events in my life that have mattered and I think are important, uh, at least to me. I love making films. Um, I love making music. Uh, and I love sharing all of it with you, and I love to hear back from you. So, uh, once again, thank you. Um, also, if you have not uh, subscribed to the channel yet, please do. Please take a second right now to click the the sub button and the bell button for notifications and all that stuff, um, because we're we're growing at an awesome rate right now, and. Um, it would just mean a lot to me uh, if you guys would become subscribers and also share the podcast with others. So, okay. Having said that, let's get into this. So, if you haven't listened to the Ashton Kutcher and Mel Gibson podcast, um, please do. It, it came out, geez, probably maybe a week ago or so. And it was really about the film... The Sound of Freedom, and how it was very odd that this film that is about uh, a kind of an anti-human trafficking film with Jim Caviezel uh, as the lead, uh, that this film that was number one at the actual theaters, at the box office, could not find a distribution home, and which begs the question, Why? Um, again, I still have not seen The Sound of Freedom, but from what I understand, uh, it points to Hollywood as being involved with child trafficking and sex trafficking. And the kind of uh, theory behind 
why uh, it can't find a distribution home, supposedly, um, is because um, the Hollywood Illuminati, the Hollywood Vampires, or whatever you want to call them, uh, the powers that be, simply want the film uh, to be killed. They want it to die. They don't want it to be seen. And of course, if they're involved in trafficking, they don't want to be outed, per se. Well, shortly after this happened, Ashton Kutcher and Mel Gibson, uh, as I mentioned earlier, had publicly stated that they were going to, you know, join forces and make a project that would expose what they know is going on in Hollywood, and it would expose the people behind Hollywood's biggest secrets. And... Uh, specifically related to uh, sex crimes and things of uh, that nature. Now, I don't know Ashton personally. I've never met him. Uh, like I said, I, I do know the town he's from in Iowa uh, very well. Uh, and I know of his story, which is really interesting. Um, I'm not... Uh, an Ashton fan, nor am I against him in any way. I, again, I don't know him. When I did the podcast, I know uh, what what I found out through research, um, which is that he had this uh, bizarre relationship, or at least a bizarre event that occurred with an ex-girlfriend of his, which I've since learned a lot more. We'll talk about that. It was really really bizarre. Um, and I was shocked to see that he was claiming to have been on FBI raids and um, like actually was there at like FBI raids that took down uh, child rapists and sex traffickers and things like that. Uh, he was also the head of this software company that created this software package called Thorn, which he stated that this package had the ability to identify and track the online movements and efforts of those involved with uh, sex crimes against, well, against anybody, but specifically against children. Which is great. I mean, that's we need more of that in the world, obviously. But the thing that I did find very weird at the time that I even recorded that podcast was that Danny Masterson, who was on that 70s show, um, it's a big story in Hollywood right now. I assume it's a big story all over the world. Um, but Danny Masterson was found guilty of drugging and raping multiple girls, in which he's going to get 30 years to life. Um, I don't believe his actual sentencing has happened yet. Um, maybe it has, but I know he was found guilty, and those are those are the years associated with being found guilty for the crimes that he committed. I did see that his... Uh, lawyers are going to fight it in um, appeals court, of course. And it's very well known that Danny Masterson and his wife, uh, Bijou Phillips, are longtime Scientologists. Now, I want to say this as well. Um, I'm very familiar with Scientology just because uh, in college, maybe, maybe I've mentioned this before or not, but... Uh, I was a double minor. I had a, a minor in sociology, but I also had a minor in religious studies. Uh, to, <laughs> you might find this funny, but for a time period, I was actually considering becoming a priest. It was a short-lived time period, uh, but the lack of religion growing up in my life and then finding it in such a strong way actually really made me want to dig into it. So when I went to Iowa State, I you know, just took one 
religious studies course as an elective. And I enjoyed the course so much, I just kept taking them until I found myself, you know, taking 400 level courses. And my advisor saying, hey, if you take six more credits in religious studies, you're going to have a double major. And my major was journalism. But I was six credits away from my major being religious studies. And, uh, you know, in, in one of my courses, we, we delved deep into Scientology. So I know a lot about it. Um, and the reason I say I'm not for or against it, it's not my chosen religion. But I'm not really for or against any religion, because the one thing that I did come to understand through my studies is that religion is incredibly personal. And usually people wind up kind of choosing the religious belief structure that fits the need of their life, which I totally understand. And I also know that what someone is, as far as their uh, religious choice, um, has a lot to do uh, with the region in the world in which you were born and who your parents are. Um, you know, a prime example would be my wife. My wife was raised not only, you know, Catholic, but devout Roman Catholic, which there is a difference. And, you know, it wasn't until, you know, the age of 24 or 25, after having years of conversations with me about it and me giving her things to read um, and pointing out things that, that I knew um, that she had never been exposed to before Laura made the decision that, you know, she was no longer going to call herself Catholic. But having said that, uh, she still felt comfortable uh, with Christianity, and she considered herself and does consider herself a Christian. And she still, um, when she attends church, which is often, she, is, she goes to Catholic churches simply because she's comfortable with that. Uh, that's what she grew up with. Um, and that makes sense to me. So, you know, I don't, if you're a Scientologist and you're listening to this, I, listening to this, uh, just know that I, I don't think you're bad or I don't, you know, think you're crazy. I think crazy is the most dismissive thing you can say about somebody. To me, it's the worst thing you can say about somebody is just dismissing their thoughts as, I don't understand this, so they're crazy. You know, Dave Chappelle talked about this. It's it's ugly and it's dismissive. So I don't feel that way. Um, having said that, I don't personally understand the appeal of Scientology um, in my life and for what my religious needs are or my spiritual needs. But Danny Masterson is a Scientologist. And um, from what I understand, even after being uh, found guilty, he is a Scientologist in good standing with the church, meaning that they have not made any remarks against him. Uh, in fact, just the opposite, from what I understand, is they are supporting him and they are uh, going to be, or have been heavily involved with his attorneys and um, you know, kind of behind the scenes and trying to get him out of this. And I know they're going to be involved with his appeals. Um, I don't think that Ashton is a Scientologist. In fact, I could not find anywhere that he was a member of any organized uh, religion or, or faith or denomination. Um, Again, in fact, I saw one interview where he talked about the fact that he wasn't involved with you know, any established church, but he has um, a very close friendship with Danny Masterson. I guess they were kind of like 
uh, Peas in a Pod back in the day uh, when he did that 70s show, which they were both on. Um, but I mentioned before, uh, Ashton was also in a relationship with a girl. Um, this is very early on in his career. And uh, this girl was murdered. Well, I've actually did a really, really deep dive and dug really deep into that subject because even after I record the podcast, I just found that whole scenario interesting because it was something major that happened involving a death of a young girl and people didn't know about it for years and years, you know, until, you know, years later after it happened. And I remember, I remember wondering like, well, how did, how was this hidden and why wasn't this kind of like a big deal? Well, uh, what I discovered is that this girl, I, I was correct in what I said last time in the last podcast. He had only been dating this girl for a short time and they had a date scheduled and he had stopped by her place. And, uh, when she didn't answer the door, um, it turns out that he entered the door and that he was in the house and he saw, uh, this girl, uh, dead uh, in a pool of blood. Um, she was viciously murdered by another guy that was a uh, aspiring actor. Uh, but this is what I learned about that case that's really interesting. So rather than immediately, you know, call the police and the authorities, uh, which I would think most people would do. I know if I came across the dead body, and I had nothing to do with it. I mean, I would, yeah, I would call the cops right away and I would call the ambulance right away and whatever I could to kind of, you know, uh, bring assistance to that situation. But from what I understand, um, Ashton actually left the um, apartment or home of this girl, left her there dead, and he went and called his representation, his agents, his manager, and supposedly he called Danny Masterson and basically said, you know, what should I do? Like this, I feel like this is something that could affect, you know, my career like in a terrible way. And his career was just getting off the ground. And after having conversation, he basically settled on Fuck it. I'm just going to roll and leave it, leave this girl for the next person, you know, to discover her, uh, which is what he did. Now, I guess when police questioned him, uh, he claimed initially that he wasn't there, that he didn't know about it, um, which is really fucked up because I guess this was like a day or two after the murder happened, which those are very important days when it comes down to finding the murder. If you know anything about crimes being committed on this level, that is true that the first 48 hours are incredibly important. Uh, that's when the tracks are fresh of uh, any crime that you commit. Um, well, this guy who killed uh, his then girlfriend or this girl that he was dating at least at the time uh, this guy went on to kill a couple more people a couple more girls so had ashton spoke up right away would it have led to this guy being captured possibly um you know no one could say that for certain of course but one thing is for certain uh, the chances of him being captured were diminishing by the hour in those first few days that this poor girl was killed. Um, but what that kind of shows you is, I think, and uh, I'm always saying this because i got to compare these actions to what I would do, Um if I had nothing to do with this crime, I don't think Ashton had anything to do with her being murdered or anything like that, nor am I, 
suggesting that. I'm just saying that, again, if I showed up and that had happened and I found that body, I would immediately, immediately be on the phone. I, I, I would not assume that would hurt my career if I wasn't involved with it and if I was trying to bring help to the situation and trying to give the authorities the best opportunity possible to capture the person who committed such a crime. So I think that kind of opens the door a little bit to Ashton's thought process and how important his image is to him. And I should say his Hollywood image and his uh, career. Now, I did also find out that uh, his efforts to help uh, and fight trafficking and uh, child abuse uh, are, are very authentic and very real. And this guy has been involved in a lot. Um, and he's financially backed uh, a lot of uh, uh, programs and uh, you know, also, again, <clears throat> you know, created these companies to fight trafficking and sex crimes. So, and that is authentic and that's real. So, you know, I, I, again, I don't know that I have enough information to truly form an opinion about him, but he did something that I thought was bizarre. Um, I should say something recently that was bizarre, which is uh, he and uh, his wife, which uh, his wife is a beautiful girl. Uh, Ashton Kutcher's wife is Mila Kunis, which I've always thought Mila Kunis is uh, not only beautiful, but incredibly talented. She was in uh, the Mark Wahlberg adaptation of Max Payne, which is actually, God, it's a film that I would have loved to direct. I was a huge, huge fan of the Max Payne video game series. So uh, when that came out, I was like, God, Someone beat me to it. I always wanted to do that. I want to recreate and reboot Hellraiser. And I wanted to write my own script for Max Payne. Um, but anyways, uh, if you're hearing things rustling around right now, Chapo just got up and skitter-scattered across the floor to his his little sleeping pillow, his other sleeping pillow. Um, but recently, um, it came out that Ashton and Mila had written a letter to Danny Masterson's uh, judge, the judge of his case. Now, again, the details surrounding Danny Masterson's, you know, the raping of these girls, which he has been convicted. So, and from what I understand, they came to a conclusion, the jury did, pretty quickly so it doesn't seem as though there's, you know, much doubt in the case. Um, so after he was found guilty, Ashton and Mila wrote this letter. And basically it was, I don't know, I thought it was odd. It, it was a letter that was describing Danny like literally like he was the greatest human being that has ever walked planet Earth. You know, he has solely existed to help others, no matter who you are. Um, and he, <laughs> he cited him being such a good guy because on the 70s, that 70s show, he, he spoke to, uh, you know, grips and crap service people, the same as he did big stars which that's how fucked up Hollywood is, where if you communicate with another human being that's a good person that is lower on the totem pole of employment, that's commendable in Hollywood. It's like, well, I, again, I, I, I mean, I speak to everybody how they present themselves. I could give two shits what their job title is. Like, but this is, I guess, a thing that Ashton felt compelled to point out. Um, but again, Mila also wrote this letter too. And they were both kind of like, uh, you know, the same letter, you know, uh, different words, but the same sentiment. Danny Masterson is the greatest thing. He is a superhero. He's so damn good to people. 
and they wanted the judge to consider this um, in the hopes that he would levy a lenient sentence. That he would go, well, I know that he drugged these women and raped them uh, repeatedly. And this is something that he's done on several occasions. <laughs> but Ashton and Mila think he's a great dude. Um, so, hey, I guess that's the counterbalance. You know, it's just strange, right? Because I also step back and say, okay, if my best friend, if my best friend was convicted of multiple counts of drugging and raping a girl, for one, I would think I would know. I mean, you would just think you would know or have an idea, right? If you really know somebody. But even if he didn't, okay, I'm trying to, like I said, put myself in his shoes. So say my best friend went through the same thing. Once he was found guilty, would I want him to have a lenient sentence? Well, I would look at it this way. I would say to myself, what if he did this to my wife or my daughter? Because those girls are, I don't know if they're, if they're married or not, but they're certainly somebody's daughter. And I think that's how you have to consider these things. When you're considering sentencing, I think you have to stop and say, if it happened to me or my daughter, uh, you know, what would I think is appropriate? And I personally wouldn't land on try to get the judge to be as lenient as humanly possible. I'll tell you right now, if somebody did that to my little girl, they ain't going to make it to court. I mean, I'll kill them straight up. That's just a fact. I mean, that, that would happen. If I could, I would. I mean, I don't know how I could process that and be like, let's just hammer it out with lawyers. You know what I mean? I think most men would feel that. I'm not trying to be a tough guy. I think most mothers would feel that way. So I thought it was strange. I, thought, I, I did think it was very strange that they did this. And it, it made me wonder, is there something... On Ashton? Does, does Danny have something on Ash, Ashton? Does Scientology have something on Ashton? Uh, you know, Scientology, again, I'm not picking on them, but they do have a history of, you know, working hard to hide uh, the misdeeds and, and misgivings of their, uh, you know, the celebrity culture that exists within Scientology. That's part of the appeal for some Scientologists is that, um, you know, when you're famous and people are watching every move that you do, Scientology works very hard to provide you with not only anonymity, but a, a, an actual physical team of people that work to kind of sweep up your trail. Um, so I was wondering, it's like if Ashton was hanging out with Danny for all these years, you know, is there something that he felt, you know, compelled to write this letter. Like, is there a reason, is what I'm saying? Is there like a blackmail type of reason? I don't know. I have no idea. I'm just begging the question. But what's really uh, strange to me, too, is that somehow, somehow, these private letters written to a judge are made public. Which... You know, my skeptical hippo eyes go, hmm, something's not right about that either. Because I can guarantee the judge didn't go, you know, hey guys, let's just throw this on the news. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a private letter written from a, a, a civilian to a judge on a case. Um, you know, granted, nothing was sealed as far as that type of information, but the fact that it got out so quickly, I think is bizarre. And it made me wonder, like, why? Like, why would that come out so fast? Um, well, shortly after, Ashton and Mila 
put out a video that was an apology video. And it was rough to watch. It looked rehearsed. And it was strange because in the video, they didn't apologize to the girls that were raped. They skipped right over that, and they just apologized to anybody around the world that had been a victim of any sex crime. They were sorry if their letter was offensive, which I think is in bad taste, just because, I mean, of course you should feel sorry for that, but, you know, to the women who were raped, I mean, they, imagine, you know, imagine being a woman that was raped, and then this guy's convicted, and then you find out that all his powerful friends are just going, he's a great guy, which those letters imply that they don't believe in the verdict. They don't believe in what happened, right? Because if Ashton and Mila did believe that Danny Masterson was a, a violent rapist, they wouldn't be saying, hey, judge, support this. You know, we support this rapist, you know? They, you know, they obviously don't believe that it happened. And they wanted him to have, you know, a, a really... Weak sentencing, you know, just the bare minimum, I guess. Uh, which, again, I see why this would be offensive to these girls. Um, so shortly after that, you know, Ashton is now just under fire, just taking mad heat, and left and right. So he announces that he steps down from this Thorn Company. Now, again, remember... This Thorn software company, uh, this software specifically tracks and targets child traffickers and uh, those who perpetuate sex crimes, specifically towards children, which is what the Sound of Freedom is about. Ashton resigns under you know pressure for his letter and his um, his video. Apology, which again, it's horrible. I mean, it was really awkward. It just seems really insincere. Um, but he resigns uh, from this company. So he's no longer involved with this company. And then uh, Mila was also involved, I think. Um, I'm not sure her exact position. I read it in a couple of places, but it was, it was basically on the advisory board or some board that was connected to this. And she resigns as well, which it just made me kind of step back and look at this whole thing because I'm like, this is the timing of all this is crazy strange because also a bunch of videos came out um, from what I understand that have existed for a long time and people knew about them of Mila when she was. Uh, young, like, you know, 15 years old, uh, 16 years old, talking about how she was 14 when she was first brought onto the set of that 70s show and how she was made to kiss Ashton uh, when she was 14 years old and how, you know, basically she was compelled to use her tongue, like a French kiss, right? And he's on this talk show, I think it's with Rosie O'Donnell, and he's joking about it, and they're playing about it, and then there's this video of her sitting on his lap when she's just a, a young girl, like, like I said, she's a teenager, and him talking about how, how good his job is, you know, because she gets to sit on his lap and how good it feels and all this stuff. And yeah, it looks really bad. I mean, be, because it is. It's really creepy. And I didn't, you know, I had no idea that these videos existed or that that was the, what was going on there. I had no idea of that. So when you see it, I mean, I, again, I look at my reaction to it and I think anybody else's reaction would be similar. It would be like, man, this, this is weird. And it's even weirder that there's a culture surrounding it that's so supportive of this behavior that 
they see no problem in even recording it and just putting it out there. Um, but my question was kind of like, if you're playing 3D chess, right, you look back behind the event that happened and say, okay, that's definitely fucked up. So why are we just hearing about it now? Why are we just hearing about it now? I mean, now she's married to Ashton, right? She's married to him now. So, I mean, I, it's not like she's going to step up and say, oh, my husband, you know, did this to me when I was 15 or 14 or, you know, uh, she's with him now. They're married. So, you know, that is what it is. But... Again, I'm incredibly surprised that that footage just came out now and why nobody back then would have said, hey, Ashton, like, uh, this is a child, man. I mean, she's 14, 15. Like, this, this is legitimately a child. So let's not use the tongue. Let's not sit on her lap. Let's not, you know, paw at her and touch. Like, let's not do any of this because this is all really fucked up, you know? But it happened, and it came out now. The same thing about the letter being leaked uh, from the judge. Um, now, again, in regard to the letter, like I said, the really important thing is, the takeaway from the letter is that Ashton either doesn't believe it happened, these rapes, or there's some kind of, there's something on him they have and he felt compelled to do it. Because on the flip side, if I had a best friend that was found guilty and I knew of all kinds of, you know, riffraffery and bullshit that went on in the case and I knew someone was lying and I knew some scenario wasn't real and I knew that he got screwed over and I knew he was innocent, that's different. But in that case, I would be writing the judge to say, hey, I know this thing didn't happen because of this, because of A, B, C. This person was lying. I know I was there. Like, the letter was nothing like that. It was just, Danny is the world's greatest human being. So it all comes out now, right on the heels of him saying he was going to expose Hollywood. For the exact thing that Danny Masterson was involved with. I mean, granted, Danny Masterson didn't traffic anybody, but I mean, ultimately, that's what is, is waiting at the end of child trafficking or human trafficking. Often what's waiting at the end is a whole shitload of rape. You know, it's the one disturbing thing about humanity and human beings in general is that People would do the weirdest shit in the world to get off. I mean, seriously. Think about it. I mean, think how important it is, you know, to humanity. How important that is, you know, to, to, to get off how you want to get off. Like, wars have started over this shit. Like, there's, there's very few things in the world that people will risk, like, their marriage, their uh, their parenthood, their job, their freedom, like all this shit over, you know, basically getting off, coming, like that's what they want to do. And the fact that there are people that would want to do this with children is the most disturbing shit in the world. I mean, which is kind of why I didn't understand why he was stepping down from Thorn, like... If Ashton's the head of Thorn, and that's what it fights, I wouldn't think my response to, to being criticized about Danny Masterson would be, well, okay, so I'm not going to help people anymore that need help. People that are stolen, trafficked, raped, kids that are... I'm not going to help them anymore because I'm being criticized for supporting... You would think it'd be the opposite, right? You would think that he would be like, look... I'm not saying what Danny did it was okay. I'm not supporting that. In fact, you know, this is what I do on a daily basis. I fight this type of shit, and I'm standing up for those people, you know? But, yeah, it's a weird, it was a weird choice by him. 
It was very weird that all this stuff came out right now. So my question to all of you is, because there's always a question as, is this a Hollywood Illuminati real? Are the Hollywood vampires, do they really exist? Is there really kind of like some cabal at the top of it all? Well, it seems to me like there was a lot of firepower against some really questionable behavior with Ashton that had been sitting around for years. A lot of firepower, a lot of ammunition. And then he says, hey, Mel Gibson, yeah, that's, that's, that's totally fucked up that they're not supporting this film about trafficking. You and I need to get together and out to people that we know that are involved in this type of stuff. And right after that happens, all that ammunition against Ashton, someone pulls the trigger. And all this questionable stuff that he should be accountable for just comes rolling out where, dare I say, he's going to have a hard time getting distribution right now from anybody, much less a film at Outs Hollywood, because now he's in a position where he can't even speak as an authority on that because people will just go, really, you're outing trafficking in Hollywood, the guy that supports the rapist, the guy that's on video with a 14-year-old girl sitting on his lap. I don't care if you married her. She was 14 at that time. And you're flirting with her and touching her and you were kissing her when she was a teenager and you were making out with her. You know what I mean? Like he has... He has no ground to stand on now. So the thought and idea that he was going to release a tell-all about Hollywood was just blown out of the water. Completely blown out of the water. So I ask you, was that an accident? Was that a coincidence? Or was the timing a little suspect? Is there a group of people that sit atop the Hollywood mountain that are actually making the calls that are involved in these types of things? I've already told you that I firmly believe in the Hollywood Illuminati. And this goes back to things that I've seen and I've experienced, which if you missed it, uh, last year I recorded a podcast about the Hollywood Illuminati in which... I told you this very true story about, uh, I was hanging out with my agent in Santa Monica. He has this bar that he owns that's incredible. And uh, he has a long history. Uh, Rich Super is his name. He has a long history with some pretty big people. But anyways, we were talking about the Hollywood Illuminati. And I could tell initially he was uncomfortable with me asking him about it, you know, to the point that he was like, why do you want to know this? You know, kind of like looking at me, like, what are you up to? And and it was just pure curiosity. Um, But to make a long story short, at the end of it, he was like, listen, you know, kind of like, don't dig too much, but it's more real than you could ever imagine. I mean, that's what he told me. It's more real than you could ever imagine. It just sent chills up my spine, man, because I, I see it all the time. There's... Crazy, crazy stories around here. Crazy events that happen all the time that don't make any sense. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff about Ashton that I didn't know just comes out at once. Basically painting him in a really bad light. And like I said, it's right on the heels of him saying that he was going to expose people. So I would love to know what you guys think. Uh, Do you guys think the timing of all of this uh, was suspect. Do you think there was a concerted effort made to basically take him out specifically because of what he was threatening? And uh, you know, do you guys believe in this Hollywood Illuminati? Do you think it's real? Having said that, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Inner Crowded Room podcast. If you are not a subscriber yet, please, once again, click the sub button, click the bell. Uh, Click that thumbs up button if you enjoyed this episode, and I will try to keep up the posting frequency as well. So be healthy and stay safe, everybody, and I will be back soon with more.
All the best.